since this is a, a new semester, as it were, and we have some new people joining us, why don't we start with just going around the, the room, as it were, and introduce ourselves? Why don't we start with Peter Catalano? Uh, hi, Eric, and greetings to everyone. I'm connecting in from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I uh, have known Eric for a long, long time, great admirer of him and his work. Um, I've done uh, quite a bit of science writing in my time. I'm trained basically uh, in economics and philosophy. Uh, currently, I'm um, executive director of a biomedical foundation down here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. How about Carl Winter? I've done a science degree. I've done a PhD, but it's in biochemistry. But I had to do the science degree in uh, maths and physics. Um, but I've done research in biochemistry, so I've forgotten a lot of my um, maths and physics, but I'm trying to catch up. Yeah, well, I suspect some of this will be will be review for you, but okay. Um, Peter Saverin. Hello, Peter Sabrin. Yes, um, here in the UK, near Oxford, and um, very wet it is too. Um, I did a physics undergraduate degree at Oxford and um, haven't moved far away, but uh, I've forgotten an awful lot because it was a long time ago. Okay, Brian. Hello there, my name is Brian Augenstein. I'm connecting in from Pullman, Washington and Augie Tech LLC. I am a CEO of a computer repair company, that, what is Augie Tech LLC? Um, and I actively deal with physics every single waking moment of my life. Ivy. Hi, I'm just here for fun. Uh, I suck with oh, physics, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I, I keep learning all the time, so. I'm expecting some fun lesson. Okay. Malcolm? Okay. Uh, I'm a writer in Los Angeles. I work, uh, I would say, mainly in the area of uh, philosophy of information. Um, we have a book uh, in uh, Google Books called How Information Creates Its Observer. It's the first mathematical um instantiation, I guess you might say, of uh, John Wheeler's observer participator. So it kind of flips the uh, normal explanation of information. And um, I have a lecture to the UCLA uh, Department of Religion called uh, Religion is Physics, which is uh, two years later is still being steadily downloaded for some reason, although I never hear from any of these people. So if you want a copy of the book or a link to the lecture, just uh, let me know. Okay. Um, I may miss people because you guys are, the, the, the software is changing your order in the list. So anyway, Philip, Philip, you're next. You have to unmute yourself. All right. Okay, well, and Philip, go ahead. I'm a painter uh, artist in New Mexico. I have a background in finance. Now, let's try again with Robert Frisch. Uh, yeah, so I'm in sales. Um, I'm selling machinery, and I'm actually also working for LPP Fusion, trying to sell the spin-off technology, the XCAN, Montreal, Quebec. Right. Okay, great. So let's try the other Robert, Robert Pike. Yeah, I'm an electronics technician and I work in laser repair and I've been following your work for a number of years. Okay, and where are you located? In um, the Portland, Oregon area. Ron Balsas. I'm a, a retired uh, academic of uh, IT and uh, I live in Australia. And um, I've been following learners groups since 2011 or 12 or something. So that's quite a while. <laughs> we thought it would take shorter. Yes. 
Sam Grun. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm a software engineer based in Brooklyn. I uh, started following you, Eric, when I, I read your book a couple of years ago and just got sort of swept into it. Then actually, I don't know if you remember, but we met in London last year at the Right. IVI Festival because you were giving a talk. I met, I met you there too, Ivy. Um, and ever since then, I've just sort of have been swept into it and like following along with the conversation over the Big Bang and everything that's been happening. Right, It's been, right, it's been really yeah. like hot. It's been hot the last year. Yes, it's getting hotter and hotter. Even in the last month. Uh, Ivy and me and the gang are working hard to get a new cosmology series started. But in addition to this cosmology series that's going to focus on if the Big Bang didn't happen, what did happen, we're also going to be responding to news items because, yeah, there have been two big news items in just the last month. The, the debate has started the year with a bang, even though it's not the Big Bang. And lastly, uh, Stuart Sinclair. I'm a retired. I live in a cabin in the bush in northern Ontario. Uh, spent most of my life, first part of my half of my work life as a maintenance millwright in big factories before they shut them all down after the free trade agreement came in in 1989. And then worked as a computer technician, sort of on a freelance basis. And uh, I'm retired, long time retired now. And but I've been a science keeper upper most of my life. It's just that I re suddenly realized when I saw this that I really didn't know much about thermodynamics. I've got got your book, uh, an autographed copy of it actually. Uh, the Big Bang never happened, so I've been following it for a while. All right. So the question today is energy. So um, an appropriate topic for LPP fusion. So just to give you some background, um, especially for the people who were not here last semester, last you know, year, we were basically focusing on the development during the middle to late years of the 19th century of electromagnetism, and especially the breakthrough concept of a field, a magnetic and the electric field. So it turns out that at the same time, this other concept, the concept of energy, was also developing. Because neither of these were concepts that existed in physics before the 19th century. What I had you read, especially the one that I labeled uh, Mayor Jewell, which is the overall history, gives you an idea that this actually was a paradigm change in thermodynamics because physics was going from the working hypothesis that there was something that physicists called caloric. It's very similar to what chemists were calling phlogiston, uh, which was a fluid, a heat fluid. And moving away from that to the concept of energy. So that's all I'll say. So starting with the first reading, the, the one, as I say, that I labeled, uh, Mayor Jewell, which unlike the other two, is a secondary source. Does somebody want to jump in and say, basically, what was this evolution? How did physicists go from the, the notion of caloric to the notion of energy? And what difference does it make? Anybody? Anybody?
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll break the, the ice. <laughs> I'll break the ice. So I read the reading yesterday. Oh, so, okay, good. So, so it started off with um, a, a couple of people. Um, Maya was doing uh, work. Now I'm not uh, uh, just my age gets to me so my memory goes but okay let's let's go to jewel jewel was doing work in looking at uh heating up um metals in strong magnetic fields and looking at how much uh energy um was or, or how much heat was imparted into the water as um he ran the experiments and he he worked out that the amount of heating was uh the square of the magnetic field that was applied uh from his uh, experiments and uh that they look quite impressive when you you looked at the kind of equipment he made to do it maya did similar sort of work in that he showed that um that now he wasn't actually a physicist or anything like that he was doing related work i think he was the guy who was the physician and he he looked at blood in the tropics and he found because he was from germany and he found that the color of the blood was darker and from this he inferred that I think something along the lines of that the heat changed the um the uh the one of the the characteristics of blood and and from that he actually worked out that the um the the blood was acting like I guess a a gas in that it was uh, taking on the heat and that was changing the quality of the gas and interestingly enough he he inferred from that something quite remarkable in that he came to the conclusion that um that heat was uh doing basically work on the gas so um that led the, both of them came to the same conclusion ultimately, and that was that heat was not a physical thing. It, 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 it's quite interesting that you can't talk about a quantity of heat. That was what the old idea was, was that it was something real and you could measure it and quantify it. No, heat is actually just a process. You heat something. Um, so, um, that I guess was quite revolutionary because it, it, it led to this concept of thermodynamics and led to people like Carno and others to develop calorimity and, and do a few other quite interesting and good things for physics. Rough. Okay. Anybody yes. else want to jump in on? Your... It seemed to me that that. Sorry. Go ahead. It seemed to me that what he discovered, he was tapping the venous blood, that is the used blood in both both the cold climate and the warm climate, and he found that the the, the venous blood was redder in the warm climate, which meant that less of the oxygen had been used, which meant that there was a lower a lower metabolic burden or a lower um, uh, oxidation, like uh, cellular oxid uh, met met metabolism, where there was less need for, for, for internal heat because there was external heat or temperature was higher, not, not heat, but temperature. That's what I got out of it. Uh, right. Out of that particular thing. I, it's, I just right. read it last night, so it's uh, hard to follow. As I say, what you were having in the late 18th, 
and moving into the 19th century is sort of parallel paradigm changes in chemistry and in physics. But the chemists were a little ahead, more than a little, probably by decades. Because in chemistry, the question was, what is combustion? And you were moving from combustion being the release of this hypothesized gas, phlogiston, to the insight that it was oxygenation, that an element in the atmosphere, oxygen, was combining with various materials because lots of things burn and liberating heat in the process. So that was the big debate, phlogiston versus oxygenation, uh, oxidation as the process. So by the early years of the 19th century, the chemists had pretty much resolved that for themselves. People were no longer talking about phlogiston. They were talking about oxygenation. And as you said, they had already learned that it was oxygenation that uh, allowed the blood to provide energy to the body because it was actually carrying oxygen from our lungs to all over the body. And it's interesting, I actually had to review this for myself, but it was actually the most convincing arguments that the chemists used to make this transition were really physical arguments, which was the question of mass, because the idea of phlogiston was <clears throat> that because it was a physical substance, as you burn something, it lost mass. Now that was true for a lot of things. A lot of things, if you burn them, they lose mass because the oxidation products are gaseous, such as the famous example of you burn anything containing carbon, you get carbon dioxide, which is gaseous. So the remaining material weighs less. But then they started finding all sorts of examples where oxygenation, where combustion led to an increase in mass. And in a transition, and this is interesting with re reference to the cosmology debate, the transition was people started who realized oxygen was, was involved in combustion. They started to say, well, you know, phlogiston weighs more than oxygen. So when you substitute phlogiston for oxygen, you get, uh, phlogiston, I'm sorry, weighs less than oxygen. So when you get a transition from the phlogiston containing material to the oxygen containing material, the mass is reduced. But then people showed other examples where phlogiston would have to have negative mass. So <laughs> this is the point where we're getting to in cosmology that they're going to have to invent some negative mass. So back in the 19th century, this didn't fly and they basically, this was one of the key arguments to convince people that there was no such thing as phlogiston and that combustion was the process of oxygenation, oxidation. You keep messing up that word. Um, so yeah, what was interesting was Mayer was coming to this question very indirectly. He was starting from chemical and medical knowledge that oxygen was used by the blood to convey energy and then putting it together with this really brilliant observation that the blood of people 
living in warmer climates was more oxygenated after it went through the body. So it was in the person's veins than in northern climates. So this was really a brilliant theoretical jump in which he put together existing pieces of a knowledge to conclude that energy, chemical energy in this case, was equivalent to heat energy. But Joule came about this very differently. Joule had a series of really neat experiments that demonstrated this. Can somebody tell, tell us about the experiments? So here we have some of Joule's actual papers. I mean, the, the papers, the total of papers ran on and on. So I gave you just a, a segment of the papers, but in these segments, what was Joule doing and how was he actually measuring the conversion of one form of energy into another? He proposed measuring it with uh, uh, what he called the uh, fiduciaries or an example would be the water would boil at a certain point or freeze at a certain point. And uh, then he, the intermediate point measured that, but he, he using um, mercury and, uh, as a uh, ra raising it in a capillary uh, uh, glass tube was uh, then, uh, I guess, leading to the um, thermometer. Right. Well, first of all, he was doing something we all have to do in science. He was calibrating his instruments. So he had to calibrate a thermometer. They weren't obtainable at the grocery store in those days. And the calibration was what we call today the the Celsius calibration in which zero was the freezing point of water and 100 was the boiling point of water. Right, Martin is saying the same thing. Fiduciary temperatures are ta temperatures attached to a phase change and used to establish a scale. Now, the second step though, he did a series of experiments with different mechanisms. And I think the most famous was where he was using rotating paddles. So does anybody uh, remember that part? It was something like he had electromagnetic disks in water and he had like a wheel attached to them that he would spin in one direction and then an opposite direction and use that to generate enough heat to like raise the temperature of the water and then well he did a number of experiments right so one was strictly and maybe this wasn't i forget which ones were in the readings and which ones were in he published this the paper was so long they they wouldn't publish it as a single paper so the journal published it as three separate papers because he was describing a whole range of experiments. The simplest one was friction, was that he used paddles that were tightly fitted into a glass cylinder of water. And he had a pulley system so that as the paddles spin, spun around, a set of weights would descend. So he knew from the distance that the weights were descending what the mechanical energy was through Newton's famous law, force equals mass times acceleration. So the acceleration was the acceleration due to gravity if you have a weight with the force on it due to gravity moving through a vertical distance, then you have the amount of mechanical energy that he knew was being dissipated by the friction in the water. 
And then he used his calibrated thermometer to see how much the temperature in the water increased. Now, if you think about doing this concretely, and I was thinking, I have to admit, I did not come up with a demonstration of this. Um, I decided I could not replicate Joel's uh, work in a practical amount of time, because you have to worry very much about insulation. You have to make sure that your glass tube is not significantly um, being cooled by the surrounding atmosphere. So he was very careful to do that. But we'll take Jules' word for it. And basically, he showed that a certain number, you can calculate how much we would say uh, in meter times kilograms of force, you would get the mechanical energy. And then he re related that to the temperature times the mass of water. So it was known, it was defined, the calorie was defined as the amount of heat in a gram of water when you raise its temperature by one degree centigrade. So one one hundredth of the distance between freezing water and boiling water. So using that definition, he could convert a mechanical energy, which we now, after Mr. Joule, label a joule to a calorie. That was experiment number one. Just before yeah. we leave experiment number one, yeah, uh, there's a common, um, I don't know if it's apocryphal or a myth or whatever, but that he, he must have falsified his results. He got the right result, but he got them by falsifying. He got the right answer by falsifying his results. I don't know whether that's true or not. Do you know that? I never Does read that, but why did people conclude that? I, because I think that trying to when they try to reproduce it, as you say, with the losses by radiation and conduction and all sorts of stuff, uh, just would not have allowed him to get the accuracy of results that he claimed to get. Yeah, I, I can't know. contradict that because, as I say, when I was thinking of me doing this experiment for all of you, any of these experiments. I worried that I would not be able to insulate sufficiently because when we're at the lab, we do have this problem of uh, heating our device. People who've seen pictures of the vacuum chamber, it's sort of a long cylinder. It has a small upper chamber and then a very long lower chamber. So it's kind of an awkward um, shape. And the upper part is particularly difficult to heat because as you heat it, because it's on top, air starts to circulate and simply takes the heat away. So, I don't know whether we've shown pictures of this. It's not very aesthetic. But in order to heat it to quite modest temperatures, we heat, uh, for safety purposes, not above 70 or 80 C, because um, we have plastic in the machine. We have to wrap it in this big blanket of thermal insulation. So thinking about that, I was thinking, well, you know, it's going to be hard to measure it. So I guess people were asking, why did he get the right answer rather than a much higher conversion because mm. he was feeding the energy in inefficiently? I do in remember from the- one, but the, the, Physics. Yeah. Sorry. In Physics 101, we called that cooking the experiment. 
Right, but I don't I don't want to necessarily conclude that's what he did because I haven't read the the debate. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this? Who was Yeah, I was gonna say I remember from the reading that he used the word uh interpolation to counter uh some of those losses of heat to the environment. Oh, then... I remember. Wait a minute, but this isn't cheating. Uh, He did do a control experiment in which he basically was testing how quickly the water cooled off when he wasn't paddling it. Hmm. So then he was comparing the temperature when the paddling was continuing. And in other words, he was feeding energy in to the temperature evolution when the paddle was not there. In which case you do get a control because at the temperature, let's suppose you heat it to, to uh, 20, uh, a room temperature is 20 C. Let's suppose you heat it to 40 C and you leave it at 40 C without the paddle going then the initial rate of cooling will be the same as the energy loss when the paddle is going. So I think that's how he did the control and how he eliminated that, which I suppose we could have done too. Uh, anyway, that was experiment number one. So he did get an equivalence between heat in calories and mechanical energy as measured by the descent of the wave. Now, do people remember how he was comparing electrical energy? Because he, he was comparing this in two different ways, electrical energy with heat energy. Sam, I think you were talking about that. Yeah, I, I forget the exact... Uh... Equivalence. I know there was a wheel that he was turning <laughs> connected to the disk, and it was creating some sort of charge. And then, uh, and then that's where I lose it. Well, let's go back to the reading. Let's see whether I can find this. Um, I should have written this down. I thought basically he had um, a magnetic field and what's he, something uh, uh, um, at the equivalent of a, what do you call it the the dynamo effect. So he had um, a, a magnetic field, a varying magnetic field, which induced uh, currents in the plate, which caused it to spin. And, and what he could do then was he could vary the electric current and he could look at the effect then of the variation of the electric current and how much that changed the spin and how much that heated the water to get a relationship between the electrical energy input and the water temperature rise. Right, right. So basically, he was using the motion of electromagnets to induce a current in a plate, which was what we would say today, the resistance in the plate was heating it. And then he was that heat was being conveyed to the water. And then he was measuring the uh, the amount of heat there. Right, and he does go into this. Notwithstanding the precautions taken against injurious effects of radiation and convection of heat, I was led into error by my first trials. The water had lost heat. But I provided effectually against its adherence by interpolating the experiments 
with others made under the same circumstance, except in that case, the connection with the battery was broken. So in other words, again, he was doing a control that everything was the same, except the battery was not uh, conveying current to the circuit. So again, he was basically subtracting out the inevitable errors that came from less than perfect insulation. So here he was able to actually get a measure of the relationship of the current flowing and the magnetic field to the electric energy. So he was relating these two huge concepts of the middle of the 19th century, energy and field. Okay, so basically Joule was doing three things. He got resistance heating, which is our, our stove, and I assume most of your stoves are electric stoves, so they work on the same basic principle. You're taking electric current from the grid, putting it through a resistor, which is the coil, which is covered by a material that ins is a good conductor of heat, but a good insulator of electricity. So you, you don't get a shock. And that is being converted into heat in your pot, or what, whatever you're cooking. Um, and if it's nothing you're cooking, you'll get a burnt pot, right? <laughs> you know who I'm talking to. Anyway, uh, so basically at the end of these experiments, Joule had a convincing equivalence of all of these types of energy, which was mechanical energy, which people already knew could be converted into kinetic energy. So back to, you know, uh, the development of the steam engine, you have equivalence of the energy that is done by lowering something in a gravitational field, in other words, going against or with a force and heat energy and electrical energy and magnetic field energy. So you had numerical equivalents among all of these, which in fact, are very close to what was determined with more sensitive instruments in succeeding decades. So we have the, the very useful equivalence of 4.18 joules per calorie. So, um, all right, so that's basically how this conversion was shown. But what was the big conclusion that Joule and Mayer concluded from the fact that you could convert these forms of energy into each other at a fixed, you know, mathematical rate ratio? What was the law that they derived from that? Anyone? Conservation of energy. Right. So this is what's called today the first law of thermodynamics. And this was a direct replacement for the caloric theory, which was the physicist's equivalent of phlogiston. There was some fluid heat which was conserved. Now that wasn't such a terrible theory for some applications. Your sources point out that Carnot, who developed 
the first theoretical understanding, full theoretical understanding of the steam engine was using the caloric theory. But instead of caloric being conserved, what's conserved is energy. So energy can be transformed into various different forms, kinetic energy, energy in a field, and heat energy. But the total amount of energy is conserved. And that sort of threw out the caloric, because if the total amount of energy is conserved, when heat energy is converted in part mechanical energy, then the heat can't be conserved. The heat, the energy in the form of heat or thermal energy is, can be converted into another form of energy. That's the total amount of energy that can be conserved. Now, I don't honestly have an opinion on this author's pointing out that heat should not be used as a noun. I think he's lost that argument because people do use heat as a noun. They use it as a synonym for thermal energy. So I'm not sure whether it's it's uh, that great an idea to throw, throw out that usage because it's pretty universal. But now, but yeah. okay, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you also gotta remember um, that that, that was in a time where they couldn't conceive the possibility of computers and cooling systems and whatnot. So probably in our modern language, even from, from 1960s, 1970s on, you know, the thermal transfer that we refer to as heat had a lot to do with electronics because they didn't have a whole wide variety of consumer electronics back then like we do today. Yeah, perhaps. I, I honestly have never looked at this question of how the term heat was used. Obviously, in common parlance, including among physicists, a lot of us do use quantity of heat. The quantity of heat is equivalent to the more technical term, the quantity of thermal energy. But we also use it as a verb, heat up the machine. So I don't know whether this distinction is all that useful. But the distinction that is useful is what is the difference? What is the commonality and what is the difference between energy in the form of kinetic energy and energy in the form of thermal energy? They have the same dimensions. They have the same dimensions. Kinetic what energy. What? Go ahead. I was just going to say, kinetic energy is push-pull, and thermal energy is hot and cold. All right, but physically, what does what makes what makes these two kinds of energy different? They they both have movement, but heat has um, friction, I guess, like contact between atoms, perhaps. No, you can have uh, you can have heat even if there's no I won't say no, but you could have heat even in space or thermal energy even in space where collisions are very rare. Uh, Malcolm, this is a cognitive question. We create objects pass them along to other information processes. Some of these objects are linguistic, cultural, etc. This is true, but these particular concepts, which is kinetic energy and thermal energy, really do have a very well-defined, even mathematically defined, distinction. What is that distinction? Is it direction? Um, what? Is it direction? Yeah, to a certain extent. Could you elaborate? 
not much, but I'm guessing like vectors. Okay. I mean, it kind of goes in all directions depending on the space, whereas the kinetic one, it could have a single direction or it could be like a circular, like centrifugal maybe. So you can still define it with that. Right. Is, you're getting very close. <clears throat> if okay. we want to say, does a body have, let's, let's take, a uh, ta -da, a ball. So let's suppose that this ball is actually filled with air, but let's suppose it's filled with water just to make it more substantive. And we throw the ball. How do we distinguish? The ball is at a temperature, let's suppose 20 C. So it has thermal energy. We throw the ball, has kinetic energy. With what you're talking about direction, how do we distinguish in terms of direction, the kinetic from the thermal? Well, I would say that, uh, that, that thermal energy is quite random. You get random walking of the energy throughout right. the system. Whereas with kinetic energy, it is moving in a linear direction. Right. That's that's pretty much what you were saying, Ivy, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you have intensity and direction, so that's a vector. So I guess you can define direction. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is it something okay. to do with the you can As I understand it. Yeah. As I understand it, Thermal thermal energy has to do with the motion of the the particles that make up the an object, whether it's a body of gas or a solid object, where the atoms or the molecules. Whereas kinetic energy takes no account of the internal energy of the object, but only its only its 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 uh, motion in space. Now, but the particles share that motion in space. It's more what. Um... I'm sorry, I'm losing track of your names, but it's more what what you were just saying is a random notion. Okay. If you have energy that's all in this, that kinetic energy is energy of motion. And what was discovered in the middle of the 19th century with these conversions is that thermal energy is also energy of motion. And Galileo actually hypothesized this centuries before it could be proven. He actually guessed, or you know, it was his physical intuition that heat was a form of, of motion of, of microscopic particles. What distinguishes heat from kinetic energy is direction. If you have directed energy, all of the particles moving in the same direction, that's what we can measure as kinetic energy. If the particles are moving randomly relative to each other, and that part that doesn't share in common velocity, so the thermal energy part has a net zero velocity, that is the thermal energy. We'll get into this in the next class when we get into the second law of thermodynamics. But in a strict sense, you can define the randomness of the motion by comparing it to a specific mathematical description, which is called the Maxwell distribution, or sometimes the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We'll get into this next time, which actually is, is defines temperature. So if you want to get from this notion of heat, thermal energy as random motion to temperature, 
which was the final step because people knew that heat and temperature were different. What do you have to do? What is the relationship you have? Let's say the, the gas molecules moving inside this heated ball. And we say, this has a temperature of 20 C. How, uh, well, let's say that we, we say an absolute temperature, we'll get into that next time too, of 300 C. What does that mean in terms of these particles and in terms of their motion? They're probably expanding. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get the quantitative relationship between... Well, they've got a lot more energy when they're hotter, that they're moving faster. Right. Right. So when we say temperature, we are actually making a measure of the average amount of energy of each individual particle in this case, molecules. So if we say, now this is, again, measuring from absolute zero. If we say something has 300 K, 300 degrees Kelvin is the same as 300 degrees centigrade in the unit of measure, but it has a different zero point, which is minus 273 centigrade. So if we say 300 C, we can convert that to the amount of energy each individual molecule has. So we're saying each individual molecule has an average amount of energy relative to each other that can be measured by this temperature 300 C. As physicists today, we can convert that to, for example, electron volts, which is a more appropriate unit. And 300 C converts to approximately 0 0.03 electron volts. One electron volt converts to 11,000 C. So when we're talking about temperature, we're really talking about average random motion. So that actually is a pretty fast motion because if we're talking about the gas molecules, the gas molecules in this ball are moving on average about 300 meters per second. So each individual gas molecule has the equivalent of mv squared, 300 meters per second squared thermal energy. If I throw the ball at, let's say, 30 meters per second, that's a pretty fast throw. The kinetic energy is actually much less than the thermal energy. That's the directed energy. So thermal energy, random kinetic energy is directed. And we, we, I like to use this, this analogy in describing how we get up to these extremely high temperatures in our plasma focus device. And basically, through electromagnetic means, we have accelerated the particles in the plasma to a very high directed energy. And when they get into the plasma, a friction process of viscosity changes that motion into random motion. And all of a sudden, we get these enormous temperatures, you know, uh, billions of degrees Kelvin, because we've changed directed <coughs> energy into random energy. The analogy I like to use is the traffic uh, analogy. If you're on a highway 
and you're with a bunch of cards moving, let's say, the United States is up to 80 miles an hour on most highways um, in one direction. You've got a lot of kinetic energy, but you have almost no random energy. You pass other cars at a very low velocity. The other side of the highway, people have a kinetic energy in the opposite direction, but again, very low thermal energy. Now, let's suppose by some disaster of traffic management, you have the eastbound and westbound traffic converging through very poor traffic design. Then you would have the conversion of this enormous amount of kinetic energy into an enormous amount of thermal energy. You'd have a terrible crash. That's terrible for traffic design, but it's good fusion design because we want the little particles to have high random energy. So was that clear so far? <coughs> Any let's let's stop for people's questions because this is really critical because we're dealing with basically two concepts, which is the concept of the first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved. And second of all, the solution to the problem, what is heat? What is thermal energy? Uh, how did you come up with that uh, thermal energy, there's more thermal energy than kinetic in that ball when you were talking about it? Okay. Um, yeah, I cheated. I happen to know that the the speed of sound in our atmosphere is 300 meters per second. This goes outside the bounds of our of our present uh, discussion, but the speed of sound is closely related to the thermal velocity. If you want to think about it, remember, I think you all know sound is <clears throat> compression and expansion of air. So in order to have a wave of compression move, you have to have the molecules of air colliding with each other. So sound can't move any faster than the particles do. So the average speed, the thermal speed, is closely related, not quite identical, to the sound speed. So I happen to remember, you don't have to measure it, that the speed of sound is about 300 meters per second. Uh, and that means that the thermal speed is approximately that. There okay. may be That's not helpful. Could you just write the formulas for me, please? We start out that one calorie. I don't think anybody's going to be able to read this. I, there's no way of typing on the... Oh, do it in the chat, right, of course. Yeah. Okay. So one calorie equals one degree. So from Joule, we know that one calorie equals, we'll round at 4.2 Joules. If we want to know the amount of energy in a single molecule of water, then we have to divide that amount of energy by the number of molecules in a gram of water. Is that okay so far? Yeah. Okay. The number of molecules in a mole of water is Avogadro's number. So that's six times 10 to the 23rd but a mole of water is, has a molecular weight. Each molecule has a molecular weight of uh, 18. 18. So you have two hydrogens, H2, plus one oxygen is 16. 
So one gram is 18. And I don't want to do this in my head. So we have 60 to the 23rd. 18 60, divided. 60 what? Yep. So we've got 3.8 times 10 to the 22nd. 4.2 joules divided by 3.8 times 10 to the 22nd equals the amount of energy in each little molecule of water. Okay, but what was in the ball? I don't understand. This easier, we've changed the ball from air-filled to water-filled. Okay. Because if we did it with air, you'd have to take my word for what the density of air is. And this way, we know um, we know the thermal, not the density, but the thermal capacity of air. We know the thermal capacity of water because the calorie defines it. So we've got 4.2 divided by this big number. So that looks like a very tiny amount of energy, but... When you compare that to the amount of uh, kinetic energy in one atom, but it's... Yeah, it's very, I could have done this faster. I could have done this faster. I'm putting... We, we actually take the factor of 6 times 10 to the 23rd back out because I'm going to take the 6 times 10 to the 23rd right back out. But all right, let's do it this way. So the mass, so 1 half mv squared equals this 1.1 times 10 to the minus 22nd joules. So the mass is... So we want to get everything into the same unit, so we're going to do kilograms. So if we divide these numbers, multiply by two. Is that kinetic? So now we have 7,333 joules per kilogram. This is just one degree one degree. Celsius. But if we want to get up to room temperature, we have to multiply by 300. So the thermal energy in an object in water at room temperature, 2.2 megajoules per kilogram. Is that one degree kilogram? Uh, no, this is 300 Kelvin degrees. Celsius? This is 300 degrees Kelvin which is the same as 300 degrees Celsius. So if we simply take the square root of that, then we have the average velocity of a water molecule is 1,400 meters per second. And in fact, the speed of sound in water is faster than the speed of sound in air. So here we have a clear example. I mean, first of all, this gives you an idea of the concentration of heat energy. This is the energy difference between an object at room temperature and an object at absolute zero. So of course, it's not energy that's available to us unless we have another object that's at absolute zero. But it's quite a bit of energy, 2.2 megajoules per kilogram, and it corresponds to quite a significant speed, 1,400 meters per second. But that, again, is random energy. The net kinetic energy, in other words, the net motion in a given direction is going to be zero. Is that clear, Ivy? I just wanted to see the formulas really for for uh, thermal and for kinetic. Yeah, well, basically, 
it's I mean, I got your calculation, but uh, I just want to- I'm sorry, it, to put it into symbols, Yeah, we would have temperature equals energy divided by mass. Okay, and therefore, since energy equals one half mv squared, everybody remembers that one, right? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that? That's fine. Yeah. This is the formula for kinetic energy. Oh, so okay. Kin kinetic energy equals mass times the velocity squared. But now we're talking about thermal energy, which is energy of motion, just like kinetic energy, but not in a given direction, randomized. So if energy equals one half mv squared, then we have T equals okay. one half. Sorry. B squared, and it really should be proportional yeah. to because I have to put in the appropriate conversion units. But temperature is proportional to the velocity squared of each particle. A couple of questions, if I could, just short ones. The, the two terms which I've I'm. I've heard before, but I'd like I'd like a specific a, a definition of specific heat and internal energy. Well, specific heat is very simple. So you recall that I just said one calorie is the amount of heat energy needed to raise one gram of water by one degree. And that should be degree C. I should have put the C in. So that's the definition of one calorie. And you can see how it's measured because people had standard measurements of grams, which ultimately, uh, before the 20th this century- is one gram of water, right? Was a gram of water was right, okay. a centimeter cubed of water. Um, by definition. So once you define a centimeter and you have the centigrade degree defined, then you can easily measure what one calorie is. And by Joule's experiments, you get that's 4.2 Joules. So this implies that the specific heat of water is unity. And that's, again, by definition. So if you apply the same amount of heat to the same quantity of steel, you won't raise the temperature by one degree. You're going to raise it by more than one degree. And that means that the specific heat capacity of steel is less than that of water. In other words, to put it another way, to raise steel by one degree for one gram, you need less than one calorie. I don't know what the specific heat of steel is, but it's a lot less than water. Water has one of the highest specific heats of most of any common material. So Got it. okay. it's how much heat. Now, that gets into the internal energy. Why does it take more heat to get water to a certain temperature? Well, that sort of, you know, gives a wrinkle to my calculation because my calculation assumes that there is no internal energy to these 
molecules. So this would be the velocity they were traveling at if they had no internal energy. The real velocity is less because some of their random motion is internal motion. So uh, if people know a little bit about chemistry, the water in our bodies and all over is shaped like a triangle. So the oxygen is over here, and then there are two hydrogens coming off asymmetrically. I think they're about 120 degrees away from each other. So that molecule is capable of bending. And therefore, if it's continuously hitting other water molecules, some of that energy is not carried by its um, internal, it, its external kinetic energy, but by its internal kinetic energy. Again, okay. this is energy of motion, but it's motion within the molecule. Okay. So since the water molecule is very good at vibrating like this, it absorbs a lot of energy to, to get to the same uh, temperature. I gather CO2 has similar char characteristics. Ben the bending, I mean, the bending. Uh, could be. I can't swear to it. Uh, okay. I don't know what CO2 is. Does anybody know what the specific heat of yeah, CO2 is? Yeah, it's one plus two. So if there's a bending right. of the uh, oxygen, carbon yeah. central. That certainly is, um, that gives it some of its thermal yeah. absorption. Yeah. It is what? 0. 0.83 or 0. 0.84. 0. 0.84. Uh, so it is very nearly as high. It's it's very it, it's no, 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 that's joules. Sorry. So it's oh, 0. 0.83. 0. 0.84, then it's much less. Yeah. I mean, and interestingly, something like lead, which we, people would instinctively think had a high specific, um, heat, heat capacity, is way, way, way down. It's 0. Right. 0.13. I want to go a little beyond the material we read to pose a question that is going to verge over into when we transition into the 20th century. Um, we're saying now that there are really only two forms of energy. Everything else is, which is kinetic energy and energy in fields. So I hope we learned last year that magnetic fields really do carry energy in the field. And material particles can carry energy by their motion. And it's motion in all forms. Motion of macroscopic objects moving in a given direction, which is what we normally term kinetic energy, random motion of particles inside a body, and even the motion, oscillation of particles uh, within themselves that have constituent parts to them. So even atoms have internal energies too. But let's pose the question. We're all talking about velocities. Now, velocities is a relative term. You have a velocity of one particle relative to another. And this gets into this randomness thing. If we have, let's suppose we shoot this ball out of a cannon. So it has a very high uh, kinetic velocity. 1,000 meters per second, 2,000 meters per second. As long as it's traveling, this overall kinetic energy does not add to the thermal energy, which is the relative motion of the particles relative to each other. Now, when it hits something, and that kinetic energy stops the directed energy, 
a lot or nearly all of that kinetic energy will be converted into the random energy, just like my analogy of the crashing cars. But we're talking about kinetic energy being about the velocity of particles relative to other particles, or we can say relative to our frame of reference. So if we have two particles colliding, and we say, okay, this particle we define as motionless, and we have this particle coming in with velocity v, then we have this particle has energy, this particle is, 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 has zero energy. But if we switch the picture and use what scientists call the center of mass frame, so we take the frame in which these two particles are moving equally towards each other, then in that frame, both particles have kinetic energy. So even though kinetic energy is conserved over units of time, if we it's not invariant, if we change the frame of reference, in other words, what velocity frame we call zero, then we can change the amount of energy. Now, if you're doing a calculation correctly, you can't change your frame of reference. In other words, what velocity you consider zero velocity without correcting everything. So you don't want to go around saying, oh, well, this part of the calculation, you know, I'm going to be motionless. That part of the calculation, the sun is going to be motionless because I'm part of, the, I'm sitting on the earth and we're moving at, 18 kilometers a second or something like that relative to the sun. So if you're doing a, a given calculation, you have to keep a frame of reference constant. But any kinetic energy is relative to a frame of reference. Let me just pose a paradox or an apparent paradox. We'll solve it. If kinetic energy is one form of energy, and kinetic energy is measured relative to a given frame of reference, given to a given definition of what is motionless. Let's take a current, electric current moving through a wire. Now, we know from last year, an electric current produces a magnetic field the magnetic field has an amount of energy which is proportional, as Joule proved, to B squared, to the magnetic field squared. But that's fine. Let's take a frame of reference in which this is part of a circuit and the current is moving with what we call drift velocity V in this direction doesn't mean the individual electrons have this speed, but the average current has that speed. And we take a frame of reference that is moving relative to the lab at the same velocity as the current. So in that frame of reference, the current has no velocity. So what happens to the energy in the magnetic field? Does the energy in the magnetic field actually depend on the frame of reference that we have? Are people going to get different answers, different frame of reference? Now, we're not talking about frames of reference. Drift velocities are much, much lower than the speed of light. We're just talking about what's called Galilean rel relativity. We're just saying, let's take a frame of reference that's traveling along with the electrons what happens to the energy in the magnetic field? If energy is relative to a frame of reference, 
kinetic energy. But we know that currents moving through a conductor, currents, electric currents, produce a magnetic field which has field energy. What happens to that field energy if we pick a frame of reference in which the velocity of the electrons is defined as zero? In other words, we're, we're a frame of reference moving with the electrons. Just like if you're on a moving train, your frame of reference is moving with the train. It must be zero. Well, if I'm an electron, then it's a zero. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Am I a human looking at this current going? Well, on? yeah, you're a human I'm and a you human. can pick, You, we can define any velocity to be zero because all velocities are relative to all other velocities. Even in, in Galilean physics, there is no preferred velocity. So right now, relative to the sun, we are traveling through space at 18 kilometers per second. Don't hold me to the 18, it might be 20. But anyway, we're traveling at a pretty high velocity because the sun, the earth is moving around the sun. But in our normal physics, we do not use a frame of reference in which the sun is defined as zero velocity. We use a frame of reference in which the lab is defined as the frame uh, as zero velocity. Where I'm sitting in Warren is defined as zero velocity if I'm measuring here in Warren. So I'm not concerned that at the moment that makes the sun going 18 kilometers a second. Fine, my experiment doesn't involve the sun. So that's what we say is a frame of reference. So we have a real wire here. Now, electricity is traveling through this wire. Let's pick this part of the wire. And we say if an electron's moving in this part of the wire, we define that velocity, which as you remember, Ivy, is both magnitude and direction is zero, okay? So does that make the energy in the magnetic field zero? And I'm giving you all a clue to the answer by holding up this wire. This is the clue to the resolution no of the paradox. No clue here. What? Bad teacher, bad teacher. I have no clue. <laughs> No, 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 this is this requires, I, if, if I give the clue away, then it's not a clue, it's the solution. I mean, you're, you're saying it's just the frame of reference that's zero, but everything else, like everything is still the same, right? right. So the same, I'm saying that, giving another clue, the velocity right here in this part of the wire is zero and the field is created by the electricity moving in the wire circuit. Why is the field then not zero? Well, the velocity of the atom versus the wire is not zero, is it? The, I'm saying at this point, the by definition, by the definition of the frame, the velocity of the electrons in the wire at this point is zero. The field is spinning really fast, I guess. You're getting close. Let me make the clue a little bigger. Remember, electric circuits, for electricity to flow in a circuit, a circuit has to be complete right? That means one end of the circuit has to join the other end. Now I'm holding something, assuming that these are electrically attached, that looks like a complete electric circuit. 
right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So if the if the electrons, this sort of gives it away, but if the electrons are moving at zero velocity here in the circuit, what's the velocity in the rest of the circuit? Zero. Yeah, it would still have to be zero then. Now I'm more confused. <laughs> Does anyone want to end? Do you all answer that the velocity everywhere in the circuit is zero? No. Yes. Who said no? Me. Okay, explain yourself. <laughs> you don't seem to like the answer. No, the answer is correct. Oh. <laughs> but you have to explain it otherwise it's just a guess yes now 50 50 i was just being a contrarian what well, uh... wait you have uh... the current going through the wire correct the current is moving around the wire yes yeah, so the at only at one this is the repair is man the... i have to answer it hang on i mean it's like the orbit of of the Earth around the Sun, I guess, in that case. Oh, good. It's not the repairman. Isn't it the case that, okay, the velocity at one point is zero, but it's not zero everywhere? Right. All right. That's the solution right. to the paradox. A circuit, in other words, if you could make a circuit like this, straight line, then the velocity would always be the same and would always be zero. But electric currents can't travel in straight lines. At some point, they have to come around because electric circuits can only be complete. Now, why? Why can, why can electric circuits only be complete? What would happen if you had electrons just moving from point A to point B, and that was it. You need the differential. You need somewhere for them to go. You end up with a charge. Right. Very rapidly, you'd end up with a tremendous charge over there, and your entire electric field would be reversed. If you have electrons moving from here to there, and they're just dumped there, then you get an enormous buildup of field. So the electrons have to have some place to go. They have to ultimately move in a circuit. It doesn't have to be a circle, but it has to complete a revolution in some way. You know, it could be an ellipse, it could be a triangle, it could be a square, but it has to complete it. Well, what does that mean? That means that if the frame of motion is zero here, it can't be zero everywhere because the direction of motion, even if the speed of motion, velocity, the amplitude of velocity is the same all along, the velocity vector changes continuously. So all you're doing by changing the frame of reference is you're changing um, where the magnetic field is developed. So here, there would be very little magnetic field developed, but here there would be much greater. And if you do the mathematics, it will come out that the energy in the magnetic field is exactly the same as if you say, oh, the center is not moving. Right. But now I'll give you we have time. I'll give you a second paradox. Let's suppose this is a circle. The electrons are moving in a continuous, steady pace. Some, somewhere in the circuit, there's a battery giving the uh, potential. It's moving in a steady pace in a circle and we put the frame of reference rotating with the 
circuit at the exact same velocity as the electrons. So in this rotating frame of reference, all of the electrons have a velocity of zero. And therefore, the magnetic field has no energy. What's wrong with that logic? You can't have a rotating frame of reference? Right. Why not? Because I say so. What? Because that's <laughs> what? not a because frame of reference. Because you say so? Is that, it because... That's not a frame of reference. You've got to have a fixed point as a frame of reference. That's, that's your zero point of your measurement. And if you keep changing that you're constantly changing your maths. It doesn't make sense. Anybody else? I like that answer. I hope he's right. All frames of reference are not equivalent. Only, quote, unquote, inertial frames. In other words, frames that define one velocity, one linear velocity as zero are equivalent. The rotational frame is absolute. And this is something that that really was um, wasn't totally recognized until, as far as I know, I'll have to check the history on this. It wasn't totally recognized until Einstein attempted, in his initial efforts at getting a general theory of relativity, to get a theory in which inertial in which there was no inertial frame, that rotation was allowed. And he found that it was impossible because there, that form of relativity does not exist in the real physical world. There is only one non-rotational frame. And that means that if you are in a closed box with no access to the outside, this was one of Einstein's favorite thought experiments, you can determine inside the box. You can't determine what velocity you're traveling, which means all velocities are relative, a linear velocity. But you can determine if the elevator is rotating. So one sophisticated way is doing this experiment and finding out whether you get a magnetic field. Because if you don't get a magnetic field, you're rotating. But can anybody guess what Einstein's actual experiment was that he, he said in an elevator, totally enclosed, no communication with the outside world? How can you do an experiment to determine whether you are rotating relative to the absolute frame of inertial rest. Um, the simple way would be to have a glass of water in there. You'd see it sloshing. <laughs> it doesn't slosh. If, if the rotation is steady, what Einstein pointed out is the water rises at the edge of the glass. So if you hold the glass and over the axis of rotation, you could actually find the axis of rotation uh, by doing this experiment, then you would get the characteristic paraboloid in which water stirred in a cylinder, centrifugal force pushes the water to the outside and it rises. So you would always know what was the iner whether you or not you were in an inertial frame. And human beings actually can do this without any experimental for significant rotations because we have in our inner ear a accelerometer, an accelerator uh, sensor. So we can tell, even with our eyes closed, if we're rotating fast enough. I raise this because this is going to slosh over into the 20th century where Einstein and others are raising the question of what is intrinsic and 
one of the things that it turns out is intrinsic, even though it wasn't obvious from the start, is the inertial or colloquial, the non-rotational frame of reference. That is an absolute frame. Um, and it is only because that is an absolute frame that magnetic energy and electromagnetism makes sense that you could you can actually derive from the fact that that mathematical theory works that it can only work in an inertial frame and once you start accelerating it you have to make corrections for the fact that your frame is rotating. Malcolm says, Unzucker has a long video on the water example and Andre Koch Assis on Max principle. Right, and Andre Koch Assis is a colleague of mine uh, in the alternative cosmology group. He's been a long uh, critic of conventional cosmology and he's approached it from the standpoint of the history of science. Um, so he has some great insights. Um, so yeah, we should watch that video. I'll be interested too. Since we did discuss the first law of thermodynamics in this one, you can pretty much guess we will be discussing the second law of thermodynamics in the next one, which should be really quite exciting because that law has generated an enormous amount of controversy from its origin. Back in the 19th century, people found this law very confusing and very uh, controversial. So we may actually be spending more than one class on the second law and entropy. An electric charge in a static only gives off an electrostatic charge. When it's in motion, it also generates a magnetic field. Is that right? Right. So how does an electron in deep space or a proton in deep space, but separate, know that it's in motion? Because in order to generate a magnetic field, it has to be part of an electric circuit. This is, this is the point that some of my oh. cosmology people overlook. Magnetic fields are generated by currents. Currents have to be part of circuits. So okay. the electron, quote unquote, knows it's part of a circuit only if you can take the overview of the quintillions of electrons that are moving through these circuits. We have circuits in our solar system. There's a circuit that moves towards the, the sun galaxy. and yeah. up through the axes. We have circuits in our galaxy. We have circuits even in intergalactic, but they mm -hmm. are circuits. And that's how we get, you know, the magnetic field. So there is Good. relative motion, but we'll get into these, these questions Good. Okay. more uh, going forward. And especially when we get to the 20th century, which we will. This year we'll definitely transition out of the 19th century. Okay, well, thanks for coming, and thanks to the new people for joining, um, and uh, we'll see you next time.